The lands and seas of the world of Warhammer are vast, mighty, and dangerous. The planet is home to a large variety of amazing and frightening species, including many different creatures and beasts that lurk in caves, tunnel networks, and underwater passages. Creatures that roam the open fields or fly high above all others. What follows is a collection of the works of the Doctor of Biology and Zoology of the University of Null, Stefan Hoffman. In this episode, we will explore the mysterious and dangerous creatures that live in the northern chaos wastes of the Warhammer world. We will accompany Dr. Stefan Hoffman in his adventure to those perilous lands and see what destiny has for him. After a long journey from the Badlands, I found myself back at the familiar confines of my small house within the relatively safe borders of the Empire. A few weeks of relative peace had been a welcome respite for my weary body. The rain poured outside and I felt grateful to be back home, safe and with my belly full. Yet as I sat at my desk, bathed in the soft glow of the candles, I found my gaze constantly drifting towards the mysterious dagger I had found in the Badlands. There it lay, nestled among my collected artifacts, its iridescent blade shifting hues in a mesmerizing dance of light. I could almost hear its silent call, a siren song that resonated with a pull that was both enticing and disconcerting. The patterns of the hilt, ever shifting and changing, seemed to beckon me, whispering secrets of knowledge. A strange anticipation gripped me as I contemplated its allure. Was it possible that this artifact was... was guiding me? Or perhaps was I being lured into a path I may not fully comprehend? The more I examined the dagger, the more I felt a yearning insatiable thirst for answers that had yet to be quenched. I knew then that I was being called to the north. The dagger was not just an artifact. <laughs> it was a compass, a guide on a journey that I was destined to undertake. There is a reason why I found it there in the Badlands. My heart pounded in my chest. My mind whirled with thoughts and possibilities. I knew the road to the north would be fraught with danger and uncertainty, but whatever lay ahead, I was ready. The north was calling, and I would answer. With a deep breath, I began to make plans for my journey to the northern chaos wastes. As part of my preparations, I set out to meet Albrecht Eisenforst, a formidable warrior priest whom I had known for many years. His unwavering faith and devotion to Sigma had always been a source of reassurance and guidance. As I approached him, his stern visage softened and he greeted me with a warm embrace. Stefan, he began, his deep voice resonating with concern. I sense a great tumult within you. You tread on a dangerous path. I nodded, acknowledging his insight. I feel a pull towards the north, Albrecht. I confessed. There's something there, an overwhelming lure that I cannot ignore. Not anymore. He was silent for a moment before he reached into a small pouch at his waist. His hand emerged holding a small gleaming pendant. It was a Sigmarite amulet shaped into the twin-tailed comet, the holy symbol of Sigma. Take this, he said, pressing the amulet into my palm. The weight of the holy metal felt substantial, its surface cool and smooth against my skin. Let it remind you of the faith you carry within, the divine light of Sigma that will guide you even in the darkest of places. 
The simplicity of his gesture was both humbling and empowering. Remember, Stefan, he continued, the lure of chaos is the test of one's conviction. Stand firm in your faith. Be steadfast in your purpose. The temptations you face are but illusions, and the strength to resist them comes from within. Remember, Stefan, hold on to your essence, your intentions for traveling there. Be certain that your love for the wildlife of the old world will overcome your lust for knowledge. I know you. You are a man who treated a wounded Razadon, even though your guide said not to. You are good at heart and strong of conviction. Chaos has nothing to offer you. I closed my fingers around the amulet and nodded in a gesture of thankfulness. The certainty of Albrecht's words, the strength of his conviction, was contagious. It was a beacon of hope and determination, a light that I would carry with me to the reaches of the north. We spoke for almost an hour there in the solitude of his chamber. I expressed him my concerns that the call to the north could be a trap from the ruinous powers. I am no fool, and as much as I enjoy acquiring knowledge, this time it felt different. In Albrecht, I saw a friend that could understand me, and as I spoke to him, I knew I had done right to pay him a visit. As I thanked him and prepared to depart, I knew that I would carry his words and the weight of the amulet close to my heart. As I stepped out of the ecclesiastical halls, the familiar sights and sounds of the busy city washed over me. The bustle of the marketplace, vibrant and humming with life, felt like a comforting embrace, a piece of the familiar, before I would step into the unknown. The marketplace was teeming with the colours of richly hued textiles, the glinting of metals and the freshest of fruits. The stalls overflowed with goods and the air filled with the clamour of sellers hawking their wares. <laughs> I moved along the throng, stopping here and there to pick up provisions for my journey. Fresh bread from the baker, some dried meats and fruits and other utilities. As I moved the friendly banter of the sellers, the clink of coins, and the mouth-watering aroma of cooking food painted a tableau of life that was incredibly grounding. In the midst of all this, I felt a swell of gratitude for this place, for these people, and for the life that had led me to this point. As a biologist and a zoologist, the prospect of discovering new creatures of gaining unprecedented knowledge about the world was invigorating. I stood there for a moment, taking in the tapestry of city life. Suddenly a thought, unbidden, crept into my mind. Could I perhaps find peace in such a setting after my journey north? The town square was a kaleidoscope of everyday life, so different from the isolated, perilous terrains I usually ventured into. The allure of retirement, of leaving behind the constant pursuit of knowledge for a more tranquil life, was a thought that had never struck me before. Yet as I stood in the marketplace watching life unfold, the idea seemed not just conceivable, but oddly enticing. I found my gaze drifting over the people going about their lives. Merchants calling out their goods, children playing between the stalls, elderly folk sharing stories on a bench. Shaking my head slightly, as if to clear it, I turned my gaze to the north. There were still mysteries to uncover, truths to learn. The, the, the idea of retirement could wait. For now, the call for the unknown was louder. It allure more potent. It's been a few days now, and thank Sigma, my travels have been smooth so far, I thought as I continued my journey north of the Empire. I was now going to the snowy landscape of Kislev, 
and the cold wind welcomed me as I entered the city gates. Kislev was both unusual and intimidating, with hard people and harder winters. However, it was the entrance to the north, and the final bastion of civilization before the wild and uncharted lands that lay ahead. I knew that venturing further would be perilous, and I had no intention of taking such risks lightly. As a biologist, my expertise lay in observation and study, not combat. I needed protection, a band of skilled fighters who knew the North, who could guide me and defend me, should the need arise. A contact had given me the name of a reputable mercenary guild within Kislev. Navigating through the maze of streets, I found myself outside a warm building. Inside, the guild was a whirl of activity. I approached the guildmaster, a burly man with a battle-worn face. We discussed my needs, my destination, the potential dangers, and, of course, the price to pay. He listened, his eyes sharp, measuring, then nodded and summoned a small group of mercenaries. Their faces were lined with experience. They were a motley crew of hardened veterans that had traveled north more than once. I introduced myself to them as Dr. Stefan Hoffman, biologist and zoologist from the University of Nuln, a piece of information that seemed to surprise them. To see a man like me in this land of hard winters, sturdy warriors and wild beasts. As I inspected the group of mercenaries that would be accompanying me north, one of them caught my eye. Among the rugged and battle-hardened faces, there was one that seemed oddly familiar. A man of average height, his features neither particularly striking nor plain. Yet something about him stirred a recognition deep within me. I tried to place him, to connect his face with a memory or a moment from my past, but it was like grasping at smoke. We'll take you north, Doctor, the leader of the mercenaries finally said. But be warned, it's no place for the faint-hearted. The winds there carry more than just cold. I knew what he meant. The far north was not just a place of physical danger. It was a land where the very fabric of reality seemed to waver where the powers of chaos danced and beckoned. I felt a chill down my spine that had nothing to do with the weather. As we made our final preparations, I couldn't help but steal glances at the familiar stranger, for the lack of a better name, trying to uncover the mystery that lay behind his familiar face. He was a man of age, his face marked by the passage of time. Yet his presence radiated a vigor that belied his years. He seemed to sense my scrutiny, his eyes meeting mine once or twice, a knowing look in them that, that, that only deepened the mystery. The dagger, ever present at my side, seemed to shimmer with a new intensity, its colors shifting and swirling as if echoing my unsettled thoughts. I couldn't shake the feeling that the path I was on was more complex and intertwined than I could fathom and that the man with a familiar face was a key to something I had yet to understand. The activity in Kislev was behind us now as we made our way deeper into troll country, and I couldn't help but be fascinated by the grotesque beauty that lay before us. The skies were often overcast, with dark, threatening clouds that promised snow or freezing rain. But it was the abundance of trolls that truly marked troll country as a place apart. The creatures seemed to be everywhere, lurking in caves, hiding behind boulders, and often simply wandering the landscape. Their foul stench was a constant reminder of their presence. The chaos trolls were also present in this place, twisted aberrations that bore the unmistakable mark of the dark gods. Their flesh was warped and mutated, often bearing grotesque growths or unnatural appendages. Their eyes glowed with malevolent intelligence. 
As a biologist, I was drawn to study these creatures, to understand the forces that had shaped them into such monstrous forms. But I was also acutely aware of the danger they posed. Our mercenaries were on constant alert, their eyes scanning the terrain for any sign of any approaching troll or any other lurking danger. As we continued our trek northward, a sudden rustle in the sky caught my attention. I looked up to see the unmistakable silhouette of a manticore, its powerful wings beating against the cold wind as it surveyed the ground below. The manticore is a truly magnificent but terrifying beast, combining the features of a lion, a dragon, and a scorpion. Its body is strong and muscular, covered with coarse fur, and its face is a nightmarish fusion of feline and human features. Its eyes are filled with malice and a wild intelligence. But it's the tail that is perhaps the manticore's most fearsome feature. Long and serpentine, it ends in a venomous stinger capable of striking with incredible speed and accuracy, making it a deadly weapon. Manticores are known to be highly aggressive and territorial, attacking anything that dares to enter their domain. Their roar is a deafening sound, and their powerful jaws can crush bones with ease. As a biologist, I found myself both horrified and fascinated by this creature. Its very existence seemed to defy nature, a chaotic amalgamation of different animals that somehow formed a coherent whole. Suddenly, and before we had time to react, it was upon us, swooping down from the sky with talons outstretched, eyes ablaze with predatory fury. One of the mercenaries was struck down immediately, his scream cut short as the manticore's jaws closed around him. Panic and chaos reigned as we scrambled to defend ourselves. I found myself frozen for a moment, caught between horror and fascination as I watched the manticore's brutal assault. But the cries of pain and the sound of weapons being fired snapped me back to reality. The attack was intense but it ended as quickly as it started. Two other mercenaries were wounded, one severely, as the creature's stinger lashed out. But as the hired arms fought back, the manticore's roars of anger turned to cries of pain, and it was wounded several times. I could see that the creature was beaten, that it was retreating, and I raised my hand, calling for the mercenaries to cease their attack. But my pleas were ignored as the leader shouted orders to continue firing, bringing the creature down. I watched in dismay as the magnificent creature crashed to the ground, its life extinguished. Its eyes were now dull and lifeless. A creature of wonder and terror was gone, reduced to a mere trophy. The mercenaries cheered briefly, celebrating their victory, but I felt a hollow emptiness inside. I turned to the captain, anger and frustration welling up within me. Why? I demanded. It was retreating! There was no need to kill it! The mercenary leader replied to me that it was a necessary kill, that it attacked us and we defended ourselves. That's the way of the world, he added his face hard and unyielding. I shook my head, unable to accept his logic. The manticore was a living being, a part of the wild and untamed nature of the North. Its death was a tragedy, not a triumph. The familiar-faced mercenary caught my eye, and I saw a flicker of understanding in his gaze. He too seemed to recognize the senselessness of the kill. We moved on, not too long after, leaving the manticore's body behind. The thrill of discovery was tainted by the harsh reality of survival, but I remained resolute. The journey had to continue. Oh. 
Only a few days later, we were moving through unforgiving lands. The further we ventured into the brutal lands of Norska, the more unrelenting and grim the environment became. The wind, once just a biting chill, now carried with it a palpable sense of corruption. The climate itself was a relentless enemy, an ever-present foe that sought to break us down with its cold, icy fury. Snowstorms raged without warning, blinding us and tearing at our all-too-human flesh. Even the mercenaries, hardened warriors all, were affected. Their laughter and camaraderie gave way to silence and suspicion, their faces drawn and pale. As we continued our journey through the rugged and desolate terrain of Norska, we all heard distant roars and the unmistakable sound of drums. The mercenaries tightened their grips on their weapons, eyes darting, senses alert. As we crested a snow-covered hill, the source of the disturbance came into view. A vast and barbaric force. Norskans. Warriors corrupted by chaos. Marching to war. Savage cries and guttural chants filled the air as they moved in a cacophony of sound that spoke of violence and bloodlust. I could see their war totems dreadful symbols of their allegiance. They were on the move, their purpose clear, but their destination unknown. But worse of all were the beasts that accompanied them, twisted and mutated creatures that were as varied as they were terrifying, each bearing marks of chaos and corruption. Towering above the warriors were the mammoths, monstrous beasts that seemed to, in a way, defy nature. Their tusks were long, their hides mottled and scarred, bound in heavy armor and bearing war platforms on their backs. They were weapons of war, controlled through cruel means, and driven forward with bloodlust through the cold terrain. To see such an otherwise magnificent creature in this state was devastating to me, and in a way I could not comprehend how fellow humans would do these terrible things to these mammoths. My eyes moved along the army, looking for more. Stalking among the ranks were the Chaos Giants, massive and deformed creatures whose very presence struck terror into the hearts of normal men. Their bodies were huge, twisted and grotesque, covered in tumors and growths. Limbs mismatched and faces contorted into permanent snarls. They swung massive clubs, each step causing the earth to tremble and the ice to crack. Advancing alongside the marching force were the wolves. Not ordinary beasts, but creatures touched by chaos. Larger and more vicious than natural wolves, their eyes glowed with malice, and their fangs seemed ready to tear flesh. Their howls were a haunting melody, a song of death that echoed through the frozen landscape. Also, slithering among the warriors were strange creatures, known as the Femir, enigmatic and loathsome beings. One-eyed and hunched, their bodies a fusion of reptile and humanoid. They moved with an unsettling grace, their tails whipping, their voices whispering dark incantations. Their magic was a thing of shadows and deceit, and their presence added an air of mystery and dread to the horde. Each of these creatures was a living embodiment of darkness, being transformed by the will of the Dark Gods and the corruption that flowed into the world. As I watched in horror at all these monstrosities, the dagger commanded my attention. Its humming had grown louder, more insistent, a vibration that resonated in my very soul. I suddenly realized that my hand was gripping it as if trying to calm the mysterious weapon. I held it in my hand, feeling its weight, its energy its connection to this place. It was calling to me, guiding me, 
pulling me towards knowledge. A truth that I needed to uncover. The Sigmarite amulet around my neck was a steady presence, a grounding force that kept me anchored to my faith, my purpose. But even its strength seemed to wane before the power of the dagger. The promise of knowledge was at hand. A unique opportunity that destiny presented to me. Why shouldn't I take it? I made up my mind. I signaled the mercenary leader to move along. He nodded, knowing I was right. We had seen enough. The Norskin Horde was a force we had no desire to draw the attention of. With one last glance at the marching warriors, we turned and continued our journey, leaving the savagery and madness of the Norskins behind. The chaos wastes awaited, and with them, the true test of our journey. We were now on the edge of the world, the boundary where the familiar ended and the inexplicable began. We had lost another mercenary on the way, he could not bear the harsh climate and simply did not wake up one day. The group was weary by now, and I had started to struggle keeping up with the pace. The climate itself was a thing of madness. Winds howled with the voices of tormented souls, whipping up storms that bore no pattern, no season. A sense of dread pervaded the air, a feeling that we were being watched, that unseen eyes were tracking our progress. The land itself seemed to writhe and twist, shapes moving in the periphery of our vision, only to vanish when we looked directly at them. Floating rocks bore the faces of leering demons, their mouths open in silent laughter at our plight. I knew that we were at the edge of the world, and going further would only assure our deaths. I needed to find what exactly had brought me here. The Sigmarite amulet around my neck was a constant weight, a reminder of my faith and the promises I had made. But through it all, the dagger called to me. I knew that I had come too far to turn back now, that the answers I sought were within my grasp, that the path I had chosen was the only one that mattered. I looked to the horizon, grasping for answers. I looked to the skies, searching for a clue. But it was the dagger in my pocket that ultimately caught my attention once again. The weapon was shaking, as if it were a living thing, desperate to break free. Its hum had grown into a wail that echoed in my mind. I grabbed it tightly, my fingers wrapped around its hilt, my entire being focused on calming its fury, on trying to understand what the dagger demanded of me. I tightened my hand around it, and then all changed. From the twisted landscape, from the fractured sky, from the very fabric of reality itself, they came. Demons. Creatures of nightmare. Beings of pure malice. Manifestations of the darkest aspects of existence. They burst forth in a torrent of madness, their forms a blur of claws and teeth and eyes, their voices a cacophony of terror, their presence an abomination. These were things I had, I had never seen before, unnatural things that should not exist. Yet there they were, clawing at us. The mercenaries were caught off guard. Their weapons raised in an attempt to fend off the onslaught, their faces etched with horror and disbelief. The captain barked orders, his voice drowned out by the roar of the Neverborn. The men fought bravely, killing many of those abominations, but also suffering many casualties that were mounting up fast. I stood in the midst of the chaos, 
the dagger still in my hand, its energy pulsating through my veins. When I saw an injured creature, its twisted form staggering toward me with malevolent intent in its eyes. The mercenaries were engaged in their own life or death struggles, and I was alone. I had never taken a life before, but now I, I had no choice. A necessary kill, I, I thought, my heart pounding in my chest. I tightened my grip on the dagger. Time seemed to slow as I stepped forward, my arm thrusting the blade into the creature's vile flesh. It shrieked in agony, its twisted body convulsing before collapsing into the ground. The battle raged on, but in that moment, I was lost in a world of my own. The sudden realization that I had just taken a life shocked me more than I expected. Even though I knew that it was a creature that I needed to kill, something just seemed off for me. Suddenly, I felt a hit on the back of my head that connected with a sickening crunch, and pain exploded through my skull. The world spun, the darkness overtook me, and all was silent. I was abruptly elsewhere, walking alone in an unfamiliar, seemingly frozen wasteland. The biting chill should have pierced through me, but I felt nothing. It was as if I were immune to the cold, detached from the very world around me. The landscape was barren, twisted and unnatural, yet amidst this desolation, a singular sight caught my eye. A flower, impossibly vibrant and alive, was growing in a place where life should not exist. Its delicate petals were a stark contrast to the bleak surroundings. As I approached, the flower seemed to dance and shimmer as if greeting me. As I touched the flower, the world shifted once more. Suddenly the icy wastes were replaced by a landscape so alien yet strangely comforting. The mysterious mercenary who had seemed so oddly familiar earlier was standing before me, a knowing smile on his weathered face. I stared at him in disbelief, suddenly recognizing and remembering his features. Lazarus? I asked, hesitating. Lazarus nodded with a smile on his face. I am here, Stefan, looking for the same thing as you are, he declared, his voice resonant and calming. L Lazarus, I stammered, recognition slowly dawning, from the University of Nuln, all those years ago. He nodded, his eyes twinkling with wisdom and understanding. Indeed, Stefan. It has been a long time, but I have been watching you. I have something to show you. Something you will be most interested in. Oh, I was still reeling from the shock, but his presence was strangely comforting, almost guiding. As he began to walk, I found myself following, drawn by a curiosity that had always been my driving force. The surroundings were indistinct, shifting and changing, yet I felt no fear or uncertainty. We continued to walk, and soon Lazarus stopped, pointing to something up ahead. As we approached, I saw what seemed to be an impossibility. A predator and its natural prey coexisting peacefully. My, my eyes widened. I, Lazarus! What is this? How can this be? I asked, astonished. Stefan, what you see here are symbiotic anomalies. The flower in a place it shouldn't be. Predator and prey peacefully coexisting. They are just examples of life's grand pattern, where two species that should be at odds have evolved to coexist. As he spoke, 
I began to understand the profound truth to his words. The grand pattern of life, as he called it, governed all beings. The grand pattern of life is the key to all existence, Stefan. Lazarus continued, his voice filled with reverence. It's what binds us all together, allowing life to flourish in the most unexpected ways. It is a force that can even transcend the barriers between species, creating harmonious relationships, where otherwise there would be conflict. I was mesmerized by his words, seeing the world in a new light. The predator and prey coexisting peacefully were more than just rare phenomena. They were a manifestation of something greater, a deeper understanding of life itself. We stood there, gazing at the anomalies, and I felt a profound connection to everything around me. The realization that I was part of something so much larger filled me with awe and wonder. I knew then that my journey to the north was about more than just curiosity. It was about discovering the essence of life itself. You see now, Stefan, everything is connected. Everything has a purpose. Your journey, your discoveries, even the dagger you found, they are all part of the grand pattern. Embrace it, understand it, and you will find all the knowledge that you seek. His words resonated with me, and I knew that he was right. Stefan, do you remember the manticore, the one that attacked you and your group? A pang of guilt hit me as the image of the magnificent beast's lifeless body flashed in my mind. I nodded, unable to speak. With the knowledge of the grand pattern of life, you could have saved it. Lazarus continued, his voice gentle but firm. You could have understood its fears, its needs, and calmed it, tamed it even. There would have been no necessity to kill. The realization that I could have prevented the death of that creature, that I could have connected with it on a level that transcended mere instinct and fear was, was enlightening. You see, Stefan, with this understanding, you would never have to use a dagger or any other weapon to take a life ever again. You would be able to connect with all the creatures that inhabit this world, understand them, empathize with them, you could be their guardian, their protector. I looked at Lazarus, my mind reeling with the possibilities. As a biologist and zoologist, the opportunity to truly understand the creatures I had studied all my life was beyond tempting. But how? I finally asked, my voice trembling with excitement and uncertainty. How can I learn? to see the grand pattern of life as you do. Lazarus smiled as he looked at me, his eyes twinkling with wisdom. The air around us grew colder as I pressed Lazarus, the thirst for knowledge he spoke of consuming me. Lazarus, how can I obtain this understanding, this, this connection to the grand pattern of life? I asked. You seek something extraordinary, Stefan. He began, his voice now carrying a strange, almost hypnotic cadence. A level of understanding that goes beyond mere study and observation. A communion with the natural world that transcends the barriers of flesh and mind. And it's already within you. You just need to open your mind. Embrace the connection. Embrace the grand pattern of life as it reveals itself to you. 
I nodded eagerly, leaning closer, captivated by his words. To attain this, Lazarus continued, his eyes locked on mine. You must be willing to make a sacrifice. You must give something of yourself, something that binds you to the mortal world, that keeps you from seeing the great pattern of life. A chill ran down my spine, but, but I couldn't look away. His words were like a spell, drawing me in. What must I sacrifice? I whispered, almost afraid to hear the answer. Your memories and your faith. They are anchors to your past. To grasp the grand pattern of life. To truly understand the world and its creatures. You must become a vessel, unburdened by the weight of what you have been. All you need to do is relinquish your being. The new knowledge requires purity of thought, untouched by mortal biases and beliefs. Will you make this sacrifice, my dear Stefan? The cold words lingered in the air, Lazarus's offer echoing in my mind. A choice was before me, a path into unknown knowledge and the mastery of life's grand pattern. But the sacrifice demanded were my memories, my faith, all that I had ever been. But in that surreal moment, it seemed almost reasonable. My hand instinctively reached for the amulet around my neck. The Sigmarite emblem, a reassuring weight. Suddenly I remembered the words that my warrior priest friend, Albrecht Eisenfast, had spoken to me before I departed. Remember, Stefan, the lure of chaos is the test of one's conviction. Stand firm in your faith, be steadfast in your purpose. The temptations you face are but illusions, and the strength to resist them comes from within. Remember, Stefan, hold on to your essence, your intentions for traveling there. Be certain that your love for the wildlife of the old world will overcome your lust for knowledge. I know you. You are a man who treated a wounded Razadon, even though your guide said not to. You are good at heart and strong of conviction. Chaos has nothing to offer you. I began to think of the world I knew and loved. The predators and prey, the balance of life's grand design. There was an order to things, a harmony that had its own beauty. To disrupt it would be an affront to nature itself, a violation of everything I had come to understand and respect over the years. Finally, a truth emerged, a realization that struck at the core of my being. I loved the adventure, the journey itself, the sense of discovery, the wonder of exploring and understanding the creatures of the world. To have all the answers handed to me would rob me of my purpose, my drive, my joy. I am Stefan Hoffman, doctor of biology and zoology. I knew right then who I was, what I loved, and what I stood for. No, I said, my voice firm and filled with conviction. I cannot do this. Lazarus's eyes narrowed, a flicker of something dark and insidious passing through them. Then let me show you what will come to pass if you refuse this precious knowledge. The world around me seemed to warp and twist. Suddenly, I was on top of an impossibly high hill, witnessing a vision of horror and despair. The end of the world loomed before me. Chaos reigning supreme as civilizations crumbled and fell. Fire and destruction danced across the lands, and at the center of it all was a figure of pure terror. The ever-chosen of chaos. The Three-Eyed King, 
heralding an apocalypse that was yet to come. The screams of the dying filled my ears, the stench of decay overwhelming my senses. It was a nightmare beyond comprehension, a future filled with agony and despair. Lazarus's voice was in my ear. These are the end times, Stefan. And it is what awaits every living being. If this world continues on its current path, you have a unique opportunity to change this. Only through understanding the grand pattern of life can this be averted. Accept the knowledge, Stefan. Embrace it and save them all. The temptation was there, the weight of the world's future bearing down on me. But something within me held firm. I looked at the distraction, the suffering, and I knew that this was not my path. I had my faith, my understanding of the world, and my love for discovery. Chaos had shown me its face, and I would not bow to it. No, I said again, my voice resolute. I will not be swayed. This is not my way. Lazarus's face was twisted with anger and frustration, but it was clear that he had lost. I had resisted the allure of chaos, held firm to my convictions and remained true to myself. The vision faded, the world suddenly deforming and snapping back to the harsh reality of the chaos wastes. As I grasped for air, recovering my senses, I found myself clutching the Sigmarite amulet with such force that my hand ached. Of the dagger, there was no sign. Gone, as if it had never been. Of Lazarus, there was also no sign. His presence evaporated like a wisp of smoke. My eyes took in the battlefield, the slain bodies of strange creatures scattered among the fallen mercenaries. It was a scene of grim triumph, a battle won, but at a terrible cost. A strong hand grabbed my arm, and I turned to find a dwarf looking at me with concern. His eyes were filled with wisdom of experience. He was bloodied, but his voice was gentle. Glad to see you were alive, you mad lad. You shouldn't be wandering this far north. We fought off the few creatures that remained, but you seem to need food and medicine. We'll take care of you while we take you back home, back to civilization. The world is a place of wonder and horror, and I had glimpsed both in my quest for knowledge. But in the end, I had held firm to my beliefs, resisted the allure of chaos, and come out stronger for it. As our wagon creaked and jostled on a southbound road, my thoughts wandered to the comfort of home. I could almost feel the warm embrace of my city, its familiar streets, and the welcoming faces of friends. In my mind, I savoured the first bite of a hot, freshly baked loaf of bread and the rich aroma of a well-cooked meal. The journey had taken its toll, and the simple pleasures of life had never seemed so luxurious. But more than anything, I looked forward to finally trying Bugman's beer. Its fame had spread far and wide, and I had promised myself that taste upon my return. I could almost hear the clink of the tankard, feel the froth on my lips, and taste the rich, complex flavours dancing on my tongue. The journey would continue, more challenges would surely come, but I knew who I was and what I believed in. The ruinous powers had tried to claim me, but I had faced them and emerged unbroken. And so the grand pattern of life would remain a mystery, but it was a mystery I would continue to explore, with wonder, excitement, and a heart uncorrupted. I am Stefan Hoffman, a doctor of biology and zoology of the University of Nahum, and this has been my journey 
so far.